Good evening everyone and welcome to the Connecting Communities Through Citizen Science uh, conference series that we're hosting uh, this month as part of um, a project that's co-funded by the Australian, or co-run rather, by the Australian Citizen Science Association uh, with funding from the Office of the Chief Scientist. And um, tonight I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that I join you from this evening, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I recognise and pay my respect to the Gadigal people. There is no place in Australia, water, land or air, that has not been known, nurtured and loved by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I invite all of you to extend your, this acknowledgement of country by sharing the lands that you're joining from today in the chat. Um, my name's Alice Motion. I'm from the Australian Citizen Science Association and it's my pleasure to host this evening's event, which is uh, Catalyzing Change in Science Education. Um, this evening, I'm absolutely de delighted to welcome um, three um, colleagues um, who have been working in the area of science and STEM education for, for some time now. They are three people from STEM Catalyst. Um, STEM Catalyst brings science to life. Um, and this is a little bit from their website. So STEM Catalysts are passionate about helping children understand and appreciate the world, the wonder of STEM in their everyday lives. They deliver hands-on fun and engaging activities with a focus on meaningful science and technology based experiments. And we're going to tonight hear from three wonderful people uh, from STEM Catalyst. And I would like to ask you to give them a warm welcome. So we're gonna hear from Arjumand Khan, um, who is a passionate environmental scientist and science communicator. Uh, we're also welcoming, welcoming Faiza Syed, who is a data analyst, entrepreneur and community worker and a mom with a degree in electronics and communication engineering. And of course, um, finally, but definitely not least, um, from Taz Osman, who is a passionate volunteer, a language reading specialist and an entrepreneur with a Bachelor of Arts. And um, so I will spend not too much time introducing these wonderful people because I want us all to hear from them. But I welcome you warmly, um, Arj, Taz and Faiza, to, to share your presentation and your thoughts um, today. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Alice. Mm -hmm. And thank you, um, AXA, as well, for giving us this wonderful opportunity to present this evening. And thank you, one and all, for joining us um, today. Uh, for giving us your time and your presence here. Uh, so hopefully through our presentation today, uh, myself, Arj, and my colleagues, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> myself, Faiza, and my colleagues, Arj uh, and Taz, we're hoping to give you a little bit of an insight <clears throat> as to how uh, over the past year we've been using citizen science and how citizen science has been very instrumental in us being able, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, in us being able to um, connect with communities. Um, so just to start the presentation off, um, I request Taz to play a small video which introduces us and also introduces our citizen science initiative in the community that we started with last year. So Taz, can we move on to the video please? Yes. Hi, I'm Faisal. Hi, I'm Arjuna. Hi, I'm Tasli. And together we're STEM Catalyst. Our aim is to help children and their families observe and enjoy the science around them. We're doing this with Citizen Science. What is Citizen Science? Citizen Science is practice of public participation in scientific research. We find living organisms in our surroundings, take pictures of them and upload them on the iNaturalist database. This not only increases our knowledge about nature, but it also helps scientists around the world to improve their research about different species living in different parts of the globe. 
You can also earn badges by playing games. But the best part is you can help real scientists all over the world. Hi, I'm Jubilee. I can even be a scientist by observing my backyard or looking at the clouds. You can be a scientist even in this lockdown. So join us online um, next time in our session to explore fun ways to connect back to nature and become a citizen scientist. Thanks, Taz. So that was one of our initial videos that we shot last year, just a raw one that we did with our phones, our families and um, young participants from the community that joined us in that uh, community initiative. And as you can see, our workshops are mostly involving young children and, and that's what STEM Catalyst's mission is. Um, I'd like to pass it on to Arj now to step in and um, take, take us through this uh, wonderful slide. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Faiza, and thank you, everyone. It's a great privilege presenting um, our story here today. Um, as, as soon as the video started playing in, my six-year-old jumped in to see. He's, he's watched that video a million times, but it's his excitement, you know, what we're doing, what, what, what we all do, um, and we discuss those things. It's, it's very engaging for them. So um, just a little bit, bit of a flashback um, of what we did and how we created this platform. Um, the inception of STEM Catalyst was in 2017. Um, the Royal Society of Victoria, um, through a competitive selection of global migrants of um, um, STEM expertise, um, really shortlisted a small number of scientists and engineers to deliver two Victorian cu curriculum components, uh, which are sciences and human endeavor and science, um, science and intercultural understanding. So to break that stereotypical understanding that scientists only exist in white skin and um, you know, some, some, some sort of stereotypical understanding amongst children, we were introduced to Victorian primary schools to tell our cultural story. Long story short, I tried concentrating that project into my local government area where I live, and I have received huge amount of uh, support from the council. Taslim, if you could kindly move on so that uh, we can go through the presentation. That was Royal Society. If you can, you know, keep skipping the slides. Uh, I tried concentrating through a program called uh, Hume Enviro Champs, um, and this was a program where I could um, I could stage the same project to my local area, and we received great um, council support. Uh, the project was broadly presented to, to the mayor, to the MPs, and to a wide variety of uh, other professionals in the community. And since then, um, I launched the program with, in partnership with CSIRO in my own children's school. And that was the, the epic year where we have volunteered, um, where we have volunteered for one whole year to set up a science club. Um, Taslim, if you can kindly move on, wonderful. So this was, again, 2017, we were launched. Um, we, I concentrated the program into, into my council area. And um, moving on to the next slide, we had, we had several opportunities to present under, uh, under National Science Week, under other sorts of incursions to the school. Um, it was, this was the one in Faulkner Scouts, which was a Muslim Scouts, and they never knew that science could be related to culture and that um, oil, oil can be extracted from leaves and things like that. So there was simple sort of uh, very gentle um, inclusion of STEM in their learning. Um, on to the next slide, Taslim. Yep, keep scrolling. We've got a lot of, um, lot of pictures. Um, this, this was uh, the epic collage of um, the science club. Um, Challenging the classical educational system, um, basically we we tried working in recess and lunchtime um, where children were playful and they had they were so much engaged in the hands-on science um, activities that most of the children said said that they feel quite energetic after that lunchtime science club. So um, on to the next slide, Taslim. Our collaborations, yes, definitely our collaborations with the council, community services and libraries have been um, um, so far, so far great. Um, they have been 
very willingly accepting this new innovative type of STEM education, which is informal in a way, but has got lots of um, strings, lots of understanding. Yeah, these were our programs. So the programs that we ran through National Science Week, um, the pandemic stressed community really wanted that space, especially the children really wanted that. Um, they were eager to learn. They really wanted that structured program. And we have engaged more than um, 500 families in our area where we held weekly webinars to fortnightly webinars for children. And they ranged a lot of topics, including biodiversity, including um, weather, weather observations and stuff like that. On to the next slide, Taslim. Thank you. So Faisal, would you like to jump in and uh, have a bit of explanation about this project? We're getting a lots of, um, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so, um, you know, just from the funding point of view, um, the, the science club that we ran in the school and everything was just, uh, you know, us just us being parent volunteers and we were just so passionate about um, increasing STEM engagement among young children. And so we volunteered our time um, and about um, about this time last year, and I'd say uh, April last year, we were very, very fortunate to be blessed um, to, with the Great Idea Grant, which was a grant funded by uh, Mary Health, which is a wing of Moreland Council. Um, and with that started our journey, um, you know, as, as a funded body. So that grant was given to um, anybody who is a resident of the community, but had an idea uh, to do something for the benefit of the community. And um, our project just, uh, you know, sounded really good to them. And so we won that grant. And um, with that, we were able to conduct those events as part of National Science Week that Arch um, had spoken about earlier. Um, after that, uh, you know, after three or four uh, of those workshops, we were fortunate enough to uh, be introduced to other uh, organizations like local councils and Inspiring Australia. So this event was very generously funded by Inspiring Australia, as you can see on that flyer, in collaboration with the Royal Society of Victoria as well. And uh, we were very kindly auspiced by the Faulkner Neighborhood House to run this event in Faulkner for the community of Faulkner. So it was called Spot the Species. Um, and it in involved children coding that uh, little gadget that's on the flyer it's called a micro bit and it behaves like a mini computer so it can be programmed um, and the children enjoyed coding that gadget the micro bit during this event they programmed it to behave like a counter uh, and then they were taken out into the backyard of uh, the neighborhood house where they did a survey of the biodiversity that was present there and they used their uh, programmed counters to do a count of the species that were present there and so we came back in and we did a bit of analysis and things about the biodiversity that was present. Um, we've got a short video to give us a, a better picture of what that event was like. Taz, if you can play that video, please. Thank you.
Thank you, Taz. Thanks, Taz. Yeah, so yeah, as you can see, programs like these are very well um, received by the community and especially the younger population. And um, we always try to introduce one of the citizen science apps through our sessions. So in sessions like those uh, where, you know, they were asked to look at biodiversity and species, we've always asked them to, you know, take out their Seek apps or their iNaturalist apps. And those are the ones, those are those elements of, uh, you know, technology in those in those. Um, workshops that just really, really excite the children and, and they love using them. So this is another example of um, an event that we were fortunate enough to be funded by Moreland Council to deliver. It's called, it was called uh, Wild Pollinators. It, it ran as two parts. And the first part was a webinar where we explained to the children what pollinators were. And then we uh, also spoke about bee hotels, how they work, what they are and things like that. And with the second uh, session, we were fortunate enough to be able to run that outdoors as planned because the, the restrictions had eased and, and things like that. Uh, Taz, if you can just move on to the next slide. I've got some of, uh, some pictures there yeah, of this session that was uh, run outdoors. It proved to be a wonderful session to you know, connect with community. People were just so happy to be outside, especially after that very stressed period of a lockdown. So you can see the little girl there. She's hanging up her bee hotel on a tree. It was wonderful. We had Dr. Lewis, um, you know, attend that session and share his knowledge with, knowledge with our young participants. So we built bee hotels, we hung them up on trees and um, Dr. Lewis was able to tell the children a lot about pollinators that are found in Australia and things like that. So moving on. Yeah, this is uh, just another workshop that we launched, I think at the center of um, lockdown when it was, uh, we were under stage four lockdown and people couldn't travel beyond five kilometers. Um, we really wanted to engage the children who were at home for a very long period of time and were getting very frustrated. And we knew, you know, citizen science was just so fantastic because um, it allowed children to use technology, but for a very interesting reason. So they, children love exploring nature. And even under that strict lockdown, we knew they could step into their backyards um, and, and take a photo of, of something that they found in their backyard, or even just, you know, point their um, phones at the sky and, and take a picture of the clouds in the sky with the Globe Observer app. So uh, this program was called Raining Cats and Dogs and we designed it as a holiday program, uh, which had three components to it and it was delivered over four weeks. Yep, thanks Taz. So the components were cloud catcher, raindrops and rainbows and water wonder. Uh, and it was with that first component cloud catcher that we used the Globe Observer app as well. Uh, yes. and. This slide shows us the equipment that Taz put together. And we, we had this equipment pack delivered to the participants at their homes. And because we were under such a uh, strict lockdown, uh, Taz had to actually uh, door deliver most of them. So she dropped them off at, at doorsteps. And because we couldn't move beyond five kilometers, uh, she even posted some of the equipment to participants from um, you know other suburbs and things like that. So this was a great program. These slides uh, are just to give you a picture of how we delivered that program during lockdown. So us at our homes and the children in their homes who are still following us and doing, you know, all their DIY experiments. Hi, Kali. <laughs> and all their DIY experiments uh, with their parents' uh, assistance, you know. And yeah, it, it was it was really, really, it was fantastic. It was a great success. It, so we've got the cloud observe cloud catcher component here. You can see some of the children's clouds in their jars. Uh, and also those the charts that the children made where they were learning about the cirrus stratus and cumulus clouds and also those little screenshots from the Globe Observer app. Um, and this is these experiments were from the raindrops and rainbows. So they uh, they used rain gauges to measure the rain in their backyard and they used uh, they made their own rainbows, they built a water filter that stars with her own rainbow. <laughs> so it was just fantastic for all of us. And, um, you know, citizen science has always been, uh, has been so instrumental in, in being able to connect us with community and also communities, you know, members of community with each other. So, you know, just uh, that was a snapshot of the work that we've been doing so far. So just, you know, putting our approach in brief um, and our vision and mission, we are STEM professionals and our main mission is to increase STEM engagement amongst children and their families. 
um, we yeah, our workshops you know focus on um, giving children an opportunity to perform to to interact with science in a hands-on way. Um, we find that children at a young age are very curious and that natural curiosity really needs to be fostered. We've, that's um, initially how we even started because we found that there wasn't enough opportunity for especially primary school aged children to have their questions answered, to have their excitement about science and the way things around them work. Um, there was just not enough opportunity for them to be able to discover and explore that themselves. And that is essentially what our workshops are. We, we choose topics as well that help children, um, you know, understand how, how, um, how things around them work. So this is just a little bit of, um, yeah, a few pictures of, you know, children in our workshop <laughs> that really seem to be, ex you know, excited and enjoying themselves. And there were a few testimonies that um, I wanted to, you know, bring out. There was one parent who said, this is an amazing opportunity for children to learn hands-on science, just like math and English. It is an absolute need of the hour. Um, and a few of our young participants who said, I've loved, I've learned so many new things. I like the micro bit because you had your own mini computer. I also liked looking through the microscope. And another child simply saying, I felt brilliant. Um, and it's these comments that just, uh, you know, pushes us to keep going. Um, that was just, you know, brief about what our work has been so far. So I'd like to speak a little bit about where we would like to take STEM Catalyst in the future. And, you know, like we've been saying all along, our main mission and aim is to increase STEM engagement amongst younger children. And so, you know, but obvious, we would like to see more citizen science projects and initiatives in schools. We have approached uh, a number of schools with our projects. And we do find the desperate need for more awareness. Citizen Science is just such uh, a wonderful program that excites the children in so many ways, especially with the technology that's linked to it. And it can be, you know, weaved into the curriculum it's so, so easily. It can tick so many boxes and can just enhance the whole experience of learning for children in so many ways. Um, and when I was just doing a little bit of research, research I came across this article on greenteacher.com by um, a teacher in the US who's been implementing citizen science projects for her primary uh, children, you know, and, and she was saying that students can use this data to engage in uh, graphing and data analysis, a mathematical concept applied right from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade. And that's just one among many, many benefits. Um, there was also a student testimony on that website that I thought encapsulated so many things. So the child said, we get to help animals and scientists. That's so great. And we're going outside to do it, which, which makes it even better. What more could you want? So I think that was just uh, all the pluses of citizen science, uh, you know, that the children would just love. And we, yeah, um, service providers like us can always work better when we've got a bit of support from, you know, the government as well. And we've realized that organizations like the Department of Education and Training and ACARA, it would just be so wonderful if they incorporated citizen science into the Australian curriculum, as we have seen, uh, has been implemented in other countries as well, and it is working really well. Yeah, and um, so, that is one direction that we would like to increase STEM Catalyst's work in. Um, another strategy that we have to increase uh, you know, STEM engagement with citizen science is through collaborations. So we would like to collaborate with you know, local councils and other government bodies such as the EPA, the BOM, um, to help our young participants to realize the value of their work. So, and oftentimes, you know, we're telling, we're telling the children, for example, when we're using apps like the Globe Observer app, we're telling the children um, that all of this data is really useful to scientists. It, it's useful to scientists uh, in NASA, it's used for, you know, the, to organizations in other parts of the world and things like that. But what would really make the children believe that their work is useful? is if they saw it coming to, or, you know, being used in front of them. So we would love to see uh, some, you know, small projects linked with uh, local government bodies 
uh, that used our, you know, younger participants as citizen scientists and used their reading, so their observations for real projects that um, the children are really motivated to keep uh, going on. I have seen a few examples of projects like these that use older citizens as volunteers. So some of the examples are just on that slide. There was one by the city of Melbourne that was using, um, I mean, uh, who were, you know, inviting volunteers to help them with a hollow blitz where they were doing a bit of survey to, um, to study birds in tree hollows. So their um, observations and their readings were going to be used by the city of Melbourne to see, um, to inform management actions like timing or staggering tree removal to allow wildlife population to adjust. Um, it's projects like these, you know, that, that we would love to see yet the younger population involved in as well. So another example is air quality testing. And this is something that we, um, you know, have been trying to get up and running. Using citizen scientists to monitor air quality parameters, such as O3, CO, NO2, NO, uh, that are present at ground level, rather than, um, you know, sophisticated instruments that are present at a higher level and um, get quite different readings and that are not, you know, exactly the same as readings that are obtained from a ground level. Um, we would love to see younger children involved in projects like these as well. And so we are hoping to make some collaborations and come up with, uh, you know, small and simple projects where the children can be included and they can see the result of their work as well. Can we move on to the next slide, Taz? Yep, thank you. So that was the end of our presentation. That's just our Facebook page. You can find us on Facebook at STEM Catalyst 01, or you can send us an email to stemcatalyst01 at gmail.com. Uh, we've also got a website up and running, fortunately, with um, the wonderful you know, support from uh, funding bodies that we've got. Uh, so it's stemcatalyst.com.au. I can put that in the chat for anyone who would like to see the work that we've been doing or um, just had any, any suggestions, feedback, or questions for us. Yeah, um, thank you so much for your attention. Um, Arj and Taz, if there's anything else that you'd like to uh, pitch in, please go ahead. Yeah, wonderful, Rosa. Yeah, just, just wanted to share the Globe Observer um, you know, thing once, once again. Um, with that project, that, that project's been around the globe for 25 years, and um, we've seen that um, the way children are interested and the way the engagement really happens with that tiny little app is, is so awesome. A um, couple of uh, days after our presentation recently, um, my son was um, going down um, and he was like, mommy, mommy, I saw this Cirrus Stratus cloud, but I found, I found this, he was so eager, he called me from his dad's phone and mommy, mommy, I saw this Cirrus Stratus cloud and I don't know what this weirdly looking shape that he's describing to me, do you know the name of that? And I'm like, there you are, if I'm not there, you're still learning and your learning is a process and um, the WhatsApp group that we have created actually is a link that um, it's, it's a platform for more than 100 families um, and their findings, even though the project's been finished, um, they keep on sending their data and they keep on sharing their excite, exciting stories. And that's how I believe that um, those things, um, if untapped, would leave this generation, you know, busy with the video games and God knows what not. And so let's tap into their um, excitement and let's, let's tap into their enthusiasm the right time because there's a huge hue and cry at the later stage in secondary schools that there's a lot of uh, disengagement and children are, it's a, it's a, the whole lot of research, everyone probably knows about it, that, you know, they're trying to tap in students, giving them opportunities and programs in secondary schools, whereas primary schools, they're well prepared to learn, but they have very little opportunities over to you, Alice. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to, to ask everyone to join me in thanking um, sincerely Arjumand, Pfizer and Vaseline for sharing just some of their work with STEM Catalyst, which I'm sure you will agree um, is just a fantastic organisation and we feel really privileged to have heard a little bit more about your work. Um, we're running a, a shorter session today. We're going to, to, to finish up in 10 minutes. So 
I'm recording the whole session today. I'd like to invite anybody who'd like to unmute or to put their video on to ask a question, which will be in the recorded post, just to let you know. Um, I can see Stephen has one, so I will ask Stephen to go first, but please let me know if you'd like to ask any questions. I have plenty, but that's not the point. Um, if, if members of the community have them, I'd love to, to hear that. So Stephen, um, would you like to take it away? Thank you. Look, it's more an observation than a question, but it just struck me as such a joyous project. Um, there was that the children's faces seemed to be alive and there was that curiosity and pleasure, which is a really good combination when, when um, paired with learning. It just, I found myself smiling while you were describing it and watching the videos and the photos. Do you get any sense? I mean, there were some snippets of what people reported, but do you get it and a sense of the impact on not only learning but well-being and curiosity and and it also struck me as something that would lend itself to a whole family activity so it's just um a joyous project yeah thank you yeah go ahead it's a wonderful comment um stephen and definitely you know we know what our communities went through last year and then being being a community member and taking the lead to to address that need of the time uh, I, I really we all really feel proud about it that we are addressing and the mental health is um, you know nature nature is a cure and you know going out for a walk and minding your children and you know while they're cycling and stuff well, while they're busy so we most of the parents came up and said that we had um, a two hour walk uh, an hour plus um, walk because children were interested and they wanted to find more and more species of plants and animals and the app kept them going on so you know they were hungry and they it, it was still ongoing so definitely it is a whole holistic approach of addressing the whole uh, family needs mm -hmm. you, Pfizer. well done well done thank you thank you um did anybody else want to ask a question i think michelle did i thought you might michelle I'm just wondering, have, have you got a rough count of how many teachers you've worked with so far? Just roughly. Um, so what was that? How many teachers? How many teachers you've worked with so far? Yeah. Yeah, we've worked with um, almost 10 teachers by so far. So we, we because we've delivered the project um, in a volunteer capacity with the school. So um, it was not directly working with them, but reporting to them. So they were not present when we are, um, delivering the uh, or working with children, but we had to report them. So there was a high school science teacher uh, and a couple of primary school teachers and the teaching learning coordinators. Um, and uh, we are tapping, uh, work, looking forward to work with more different schools. But um, yeah, as, as I say, the classical educational system has got that uh, dead end of, you know, only teachers working with schools in school hours really kills this project down. Uh, they can't Teachers don't have the time to incorporate new things uh, like this, even though they tick all the boxes. But um, and there is no innovative system, which is which is apart from incursion. We can't um, find ourselves labeling as who we are and what we can do at schools because we are not teachers. So yeah, that's that's the biggest barrier. I had wondered about that because I was wondering how many of those teachers would have also come away feeling a bit better about knowing a bit more about citizen science and knowing a bit more about how they can incorporate it in their schools. Uh, do you ever go and do a, you know, six months later on or whatever, you know, how are you going with it? Do you need anything else type of, type of review with the teachers? Um, no, not as such, because once we finished doing it, they didn't continue doing it either. So it was not, it's not a part of the curriculum. They don't do it the way we do it. So it's um, like, again, audiovisual um, things and hands-on meaning when, when, as and when the teachers schedule it. Um, so we, we learned it from one of the teachers saying that they wanted to le um, give children this lesson of seed germination. So after working with us, they thought that rather than showing them the graphics and working with them, why not sow the seeds and get children, you know? So those, those kind of things that I hear from and does make a lot of difference yeah thanks michelle thanks ash for the the answers there i might ask a question if that's okay but please do let us know if you'd like to ask anything anyone who's in the meeting um so 
you know, given that, that you've mentioned, you know, you've got these fantastic programs, but sustainability or something continuing once you've left the classroom um, is one of the challenges here. Do um, you have any sense of what is needed to make a project like this sustainable or what, you know, what interventions do we either need in our schools or our funding systems to make something like these projects become, you know, a kind of a normal occurrence within primary and secondary schools. If, um, if I can just answer that question in one word, it's the curriculum codes, I believe. Teacher loves looking at the curriculum code and what, how, how can they incorporate those things? And because STEM is a cross and uh, um, citizen science is actually across STEM and as well as languages. So I've seen that the project that I was talking about, which has been here on the globe for 25 years and Australian schools have still yet to adapt those program, actually has got um, books written on clouds and weather conditions and things like that. And this, the books are re read as their English language and the, the practicals and the hands-on science learning and the measurements go across maths, mathematics, science, and their other, other stuff. So one answer to Alice's question is um, maybe we bring it from the, um, from the management. So the schools get, just like the schools in Victoria got that thing that uh, we, the, the component that they had to deliver um, in 2017, science as a human endeavor. And ever since then, everyone, every school had to adapt um, their topics and learning where they incorporated um, science as a human endeavor and science as an intercultural understanding. So those two components are why not science to be as hands-on or, you know, something, I don't know, I don't have the right answer, but science uh, uh, learned through the lens of citizen science, you know, uh, if that could be incorporated and officially bought and introduced to schools. Because UK has done that, US has done that, and it's been more than a decade that they have done this. Um, probably we are, we are lagging a bit behind. Thanks, Arjuman. I think this also ties in, you know, some of the perspectives from Stephen and Michelle in the chat and from um, yourself and Pfizer, as you've spoken about this, is that um, citizen science really does seem to be a very holistic way of learning within schools. Um, I know Michelle had mentioned, you know, this idea of science, technology, maths, English, um, also art. Um, we've heard from, you know, um, health and, and fitness, if you go walking or climbing or, and then in terms of mental health and connection to uh, nature, there's a very powerful message here. Um, so I think what you're doing in this space is wonderful. And, um, you know, from our conversations, um, something that we're really looking at in our team and Yaler is here too, is, is how to sort of integrate citizen science in the curriculum. Um, so I think maybe we need to continue to share some of these examples and to highlight their importance and maybe to share these with um, you know people from the education departments or people from government to to sort of advocate for the use of citizen science in schools and um, so hearing from you all today is you know just another example of, of how we can we can bring some of these ideas into into hopefully um, more of a sustainable reality. Um, anybody else got a question? I think we've got time for one more before we close the session, if that's okay with all of you, um, Arsh, Pfizer, and Tass. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, that's fine, Alex, yeah. With that, take does, another question. Um, does anybody else have one or am I permitted to go? Should I go for it? Um, so I was really interested to know from your perspective of the apps that you've used, you know, the citizen science projects that you've used, what are some of the things that make them most adaptable for use in the classroom? What are you looking for in those projects or the design of those projects? I feel like I, when we talk about the apps, um, I would say right from the start, Alice, the fact that, you know, there is an app for that itself has been news to or I think all of our participants, I don't think any of them had actually heard of them before. Um, so, you know, if, from the time that we actually asked them to, uh, or, you know, ask the parents to download the apps on their mobile devices, and then they have it opened up 
um, and, and they see what it looks like, that itself has, has excited them because they haven't seen an app that identifies a species, even just pointing the camera, I think, to something, to a leaf or an insect. Um, and having that name pop up on the screen just excites the children so much. Um, it's, um, it's very new to families around us. I think, I think the part of Melbourne that we um, have started our community work in is probably a bit disconnected from um, you know, the STEM activities that are going on in the city. And so it's, it's a very new concept, even you know, apps that identify species like, like the Seek and the iNaturalist. Um, also, but it has been great to see um, that, you know, websites like a naturalist have that um, Australian wing as well. So they've got that, uh, they've got a website branching out that um, focuses on Australian animals, which, which has been fantastic. It is quite important that children are able to relate to what they see. Um, and especially on the website, you know, we have been, uh, we've created that account on a naturalist and we encourage the children to put their, their findings onto the website and then um, there are those beautiful options on the website where they can uh, where they can have a visual there to see the where the, the concentration of um, you know certain animals are and they're always looking for animals that they know like like the common magpie uh, or the or the cockatoo you know animals that they can see in their backyard so it, it's it's fantastic and that's what sort of upsets us that you know there is uh, such a beautiful infrastructure present in citizen science it's all there. Um, it just needs to be introduced to more children and their families, like Stephen said, um, at, a, at a larger scale, you know, and we think schools would just, just be the perfect place to do that. I hope that answers your question, Alice. Is there anything that I missed out on? Oh, I think that was a, that's a wonderful way um, to end um, today's session, to close that. That was a wonderful answer, and I agree with you. I don't think the, the, there are a few better ways to connect communities with citizen science than by starting with schools, because you can reach people of all ages if you engage young people and their families and their communities. Um, I think we'll draw today's session to a close. Um, thanks to all of you who joined us this evening, and we hope to see you again next week. Please join me once again in offering our sincere thanks um, to Arjuman Khan, Tazleen Usman and Faiza Syed and from STEM Catalyst. Thank you all for your contributions today and your presentation. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Absolutely everyone. Thank you, yes. Thank you everyone. Much. Thanks so much for everyone for your time and your presence. It was wonderful being here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.